Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on a series of podcasts that will focus on infrared technologies and applications. Uh, for today's podcast, we have myself, I'm Gary Spingarn, and Albert too. Albert is the marketing engineer for our shortwave infrared detectors and image sensors and cameras. I currently serve as product manager for mid-infrared products, which include NASB detectors, mid-infrared LEDs, and quantum cascade lasers. You may be wondering what we mean by shortwave infrared and mid-infrared. Uh, there's going to be a lot of acronyms. I'll let Albert explain. Thanks, Gary. While thinking about infrared, usually people think about heat detection since it was discovered a couple a century ago. Uh, but after a century of research, uh, people realized about different regions in their infrared band have different characteristics. So they divided it into near infrared, short wave infrared, mid infrared, long wave infrared, and far infrared. There are multiple definitions, uh, but typically people define near infrared from 700 nanometers to 1000 nanometers. But short wave infrared starts from 1000 nanometers to 3 micron. Mid infrared mm -hmm. is from 3 micron to uh, 8 micron, and long wave infrared, 8 micron to like around 25 nano micron. And then over that is called far infrared. So let's start with short wave infrared. One of the mm -hmm. benefits of short wave infrared for infrared detection is it has the capability to detect emitted light and reflective light, mm -hmm. which actually, after 3 micron reflective light, it's not that easy to detect. While short wave comes in, uh, that we could see the outline and also detect the heat at the same time, which mm -hmm. is widely used for night vision or security purposes. Gary, you want to talk a little bit about mid infrared? Absolutely, that's my department. So again, consider the mid infrared to be wavelengths of three microns and longer. If we consider the temperature of a human fever, looking at Wine's displacement law. The peaks usually occur around the mid infrared, around 8 or 10 micron. Although in gas is very capable of some temperature measurements, uh, lower cost instruments tend to use detectors that are sensitive to these peaks of output in the longer wavelengths. And this rings true for cooler substrates when we say cooler things that aren't red hot to the naked eye, objects in process monitoring and semiconductor. Uh, mid infrared is also a very popular choice for the same reasons. Uh, this is where an ASB, indium arsenide and tinamide, comes in. Blazing fast speed, high shunt resistance, uh, it's a great choice for pyrometers uh, and similar instruments. However, it is difficult, not to mention costly in developing, to make a camera that has mid-infrared sensitive material. Fortunately, there's many options for the shortwave infrared camera, right, Albert? Yep, Gary. There are many options for shortwave infrared cameras using different detectors, such as MCT, uh, type 2 super lattice or in gas. In the past, people usually use MCT as their detector for short wave infrared since it has broad bandwidth and it's the only option in the market. But nowadays, with the improvement of fabrication processes, people have started to choose in gas or type 2 super lattice, especially for in gas, because in gas provides a high sensitivity with low, less requirement on handling and operations. Also, the cost is another reason. We'll dive deeper into this part in the next series. There are actually a lot of applications using short wave infrared cameras. I mentioned earlier we could uh, detect the emitted light, the reflective light. Not only that, but also short wave infrared could also uh, penetrate kind of like smog, uh, smoke and fog, uh, which is what useful for landscape monitoring or free space optical communication. Others such as NDT. Short wave infrared could penetrate low energy surfaces such as silicon and plastic, which means you could do non instructive inspections without using high energy sources such as X ray. Um, talking a lot about cameras, but infrared is not only about imaging. A lot of other techniques could be used, such as spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a great way to identify compounds or material based uh, on the absorption rate or the reflective rate, especially in the infrared region. Gary, why don't you give us more details about it? Absolutely. So I actually made my start uh, in our spectroscopy group. Uh, first, let's consider the physical nature of, of molecules. Uh, they experience vibrational states at certain energy levels, and we can alter or change these levels with infrared light. Uh, visible and uh, ultraviolet light simply has too much energy. Those are going to cause instances of fluorescence or chemiluminescence. The essence of absorption spectroscopy is a light source, uh, something to absorb this energy, and then a detector. Now, it's not so simple to choose a detector, 
uh, and a light source. Typical detectors enlist, at least in the infrared, in gas, in ASB, MCT, mercury, cadmium, telluride, uh, and lead detectors, uh, each with their own trade-offs. I'm going to add some quick points now, but this will be fully expanded upon in uh, one of our future episodes. So in-gas, as mentioned before, is really good for the near infrared. It's the tried and true and the gold standard. However, no matter what you do, uh, no matter how much you cool it, uh, you're not going to get past three micron. That's where these other materials come in. Mercury cadmium telluride, a very popular choice in FTIR applications since it can reach very, very long wavelengths and it's highly sensitive. However, the nature of the material with its spatial sensitivities um, and fluctuating D star unit to unit dynamic range can be limited. Uh, then there are also lead detectors, which have high sensitivity out to about five micron or so and are a pretty good value. However, they experience a very large amount of temperature dependence and they cut off at the shorter wavelengths. Then there's an ASB, which is kind of the newer chemistry on the block. Again, indium arsenide and antinamide, very consistent in its manufacturing, can show great linearity, can also operate at room temperature pretty easily, uh, which is pretty tough to say for other chemistries. However, more times than not, there is going to be a marginal sacrifice uh, in D star or sensitivity. Uh, but again, this will all be expanded upon later. Then we come to the light sources, right? There's the light source, the thing that's absorbing the light, you know, creating some you know, absorption characteristic, and then the detector. There are, of course, thermal light sources, right? Black body radiation that emit all sorts of wavelengths. However, they aren't quite power efficient, they have short lifetimes, and they don't provide a whole lot of output. Then there's the LED, a little bit more output, much more efficient on power consumption and lifetime. However, it's usually going to center in on one wavelength. Uh, and it doesn't create, it doesn't provide a whole lot of output power. Then there's the quantum cascade laser. Uh, this is the highest echelon of infrared uh, light sources. Will provide the most output, can provide very, very, very specific bands, which is great for gas analysis or very, very wide band with high output. Everyone wants more output. Quantum cascade lasers are a very high performance uh, component, uh, usually pretty expensive. Again, I'll be expanding upon this later. So when we take the example of light source, something in the middle, and detector, uh, a classic example uh, is moisture monitoring, something you run into a lot, right, Albert? Yeah, Gary. Actually, the water absorption rate has a couple peaks in the shortwave infrared region, especially around 1450 nanometers. Liquid could be easily differentiated in this region. People use this uh, benefit, actually, to uh, adapt it into different technology, different uh, processes such as moisture detection or process monitoring. Also, do you know that shortwave infrared is great to identify main materials such as plastic? For instance, around 1700 to 2200 nanometers, we could see the difference of PVC, PET, and PP. Gotcha. So I actually uh, want to put in my two cents with my background as a chemical engineer when it comes to recycling. Uh, there's a huge problem in the world right now when it comes to plastic, since different materials require different processes. Sorting is absolutely critical, but if the sorting is inefficient, it can torpedo absolutely everything. So is there a way that this technology you're talking about can help? Yeah, Gary, right now for a lot of recycling plants, they're adapting a new technology called, a new technique called hyperspectral imaging, which is uh, collecting the spatial information of multiple objects at the same time you are uh, differentiating objects using the spectrum information. In this case, we could differentiate the plastics and separate it based on the uh, spectrum information. Uh, for this technology, the detector would require with high speed, high sensitivity, the features will be beneficial when it, such as a uh, partial readout. Uh, probably in the next couple of future uh, series, we'll uh, dive deeper into it. But for 1700, 2500, nanometers, there's actually not much options. Uh, talking so much about compound identification, short mm -hmm. infrared is very good for solid objects or liquid. Uh, a lot of people ask me about gas detection, such as methane. Uh, that's a, like a category for mid-infrared. Uh, and right, Gary? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I run into ga gas analysis uh, all the time. Um, and I really like the mid infrared for several reasons, but first I want to give some background. There are several ways to go about gas analysis. There are pellister and catalytic detectors that re rely on a chemical reaction. 
there's electrochemical, which is kind of similar. A substrate reacts and creates electrical signal. Uh, the thing about those is the pellister and the catalytics are very cheap, but they do not last very long and they aren't too sensitive. Electrochemical can provide a lot of sensitivity across many compounds, however, they degrade over time and also can be quite finicky with environmental conditions and also need oxygen. Uh, then there's optical detection, uh, which up to this point, uh, the biggest hurdle has been the components themselves, and there have been a lot of developments. Optical detection can offer longer lifetimes, low power consumption, and very high sensitivity. So one needs to consider the line strength survey for methane. Uh, line strength survey shows where a gas absorbs its light. Looking at methane, it absorbs very, very heavily at 3.3, which is great, but the added benefit here is that there aren't ab absorption characteristics around it. And optical detection interference is probably the biggest problem. So again, looking at line strength surveys, methane absorbs very, very heavily at 3.3 micron, but a lot of other gases do not. This can really increase the sensitivity of uh, the measurement. And this applies to other uh, chemicals and molecules as well. They have such unique and differentiating characteristics in the infrared due to the vibrational nature of molecules. So it should come as no surprise that measurements in the infrared hold a lot of untapped potential uh, that will soon be unlocked by developments in the technology. Uh, in future episodes, we're actually going to be diving deeper into these regions and technologies. Albert will be back uh, explaining shortwave infrared and diving deeper uh, into image sensors and cameras uh, and other things about the technology. I will be back to just have a more in-depth discussion on infrared detectors and also the infrared uh, light sources I listed before. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, thank you for your time.